Okay. Yeah. Thanks for thanks for coming. Um, well, yeah. Now maybe we're going to be close the door because there is a little bit of noise outside. Um, today we're talking about uh, a tool that we that we're using quite a lot when using in, in, when using Python code, um, and that's the Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jupyter Notebook is technically not Python exclusive. You can also run R in it, but I will um, be using it mostly with Python. So um, in this session, I will not go into the details of Python itself. I will tell. I will. I will focus on on the notebook, what it is and what it uh, can do and what it can't do. Well, mostly what it can do. So um, if you if you know a little bit about Python, you know that you can run Python in two ways. You can either um, write a script and then run the whole script, or you can run it into in an interactive mode like this, uh, where you get these um, three um, arrows that tell you that you can now <coughs> enter a line. And um, when you press enter, you execute it. And um, for when, when we develop something, mo mo in, in our case, most of the times when we develop something, we want to have, um, we, we're kind of inching towards our goal um, for data analysis or for something like that. And the interactive version is better for that, but the interactive, uh, simple, the, the simply the Python version of the interactive version it, uh, is not that convenient. So there has been an, uh, another version of Python that was the the IPython, which was a little bit um, optimized for this inter for this interactive session. And um, you can see this here. Um, it, it, yeah, of course. Uh, it's it's sim it's similar than that. But it also um, it, it shows it it has some more features, and based on this IPython was built the Jupyter notebook. Um, the Jupyter notebook is basically an interactive Python session in your browser, and in order to install it, uh, the the easiest way. Um, Uh, if you go to the Jupyter website, um, the Jupyter Notebook, uh, what they recommend is actually, uh, is uh, using using the Conda installer. So if you um, if you don't know, Anaconda is kind of a package manager for uh, a very flexible package manager for mainly Python programs. Um, and if you just go to uh, Conda.io. You can get these these installers for your system, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. Um, it's actually very straightforward. And then once you have it installed in your terminal, you just type conda install minus c conda forge and then um, notebook. And that's once you've done that. Um, actually. So I've, I've, I've created this, this environment here. Um, I want to do it, show you how to do it, but uh, of course I forgot to uninstall it. Let's say uh, conda. A notebook, and it will it will take a while, and it will probably tell me that everything is already installed and up to date. Um, for you, it will then ins install it um, if you haven't done this yet. I'm gonna just interrupt this now. And now, once it's once you've installed it, uh, you just type to Python notebook. Enter, and what it does, it's it's uh, spinning up a web server on your machine, and then launching the browser to point at this web server. So you can see here that this is kind of a file browser browser in the in the directory that I've that I've started, and you see there is um, there's one notebook already open, 
or not already present. And um, these notebooks have the have the extension .ipynb, so I Python notebook. Um, if we want to create uh, a new fold, if you want to create something new, we can click up here on the new button, and we can let's let's start with a folder because that's a little bit obscure. And then once it's done, we finish. If we send new folder, we'll just create a new folder called it untitled folder, and it will appear here. And you want to probably rename it, and to rename it, that's a little bit inconvenient. You tick this box. And then you can select rename. It's got, I call it training. And then I can go into this folder. And if you uh, so, if you look at this directory now, you can see there's a new folder training. And I can also say, click here, new, and then um, in this my case, I've installed both Python and R, so I can select which one it do is. But in this case, I'm, I'm opening um, Python, and that gives me um, the actual notebook. So this is where the the, mag the magic really begins. Um, if you've never done it before, uh, it's they actually have quite a nice help you have here. Um, if you go to help and then user interface tour, it will tell you the it, it will point out the most the different things. Um, but uh, so feel free to do that. It has um, it has a list of, of keyboard shortcuts that you can go through. Um, they have, the help is actually pretty good. It also has references to the most important um, Python libraries. Uh, so here is the logo. Then here, here we have the name of our, the name of our uh, Python notebook. And of course, it starts untitled. Um, if you look at here, um, so we have this untitled I Python notebook, and I can just change this here and say training. So I just clicked on the name untitled. It opened up a window to add a new name, and now. It should be training the iPython notebook. Um, the most, but the, the biggest thing that you will see is here the, the cell. And if you, and and over the course of the of of you creating this thing, you will mostly add new cells. And there are two basic types of cells. There is a code cell, and there is a markdown cell. Um, and, and you can select this up here with this little uh, token, code and markdown. There's also keyboard shortcuts, but um, the easier, easier way to remember is, is this. Uh, ah, I want to talk about the. <laughs> I want to talk about the color. There's also two, two. Um, Two modes. Uh, at the moment, I'm in the I'm in the edit mode. That means um, you see that here's a green border around it, and you see that here there's a little um, pen. I think it's a pencil, it's supposed to be a pencil, yeah. and that means I'm currently in edit mode, and all the, everything that I type with my with my keyboard gets entered in there. So something like that. Um, if I press escape. The border turns blue, and this little edit icon up here has disappeared. And this means that I'm now in command mode. And now um, different buttons can create mean different mean different things. For example, if I now press M, I will change the type to Markdown. Um, and uh, yeah, forgot how to how to put it back into code. So. Um, and you can get back. Uh, you, you can go back from, but you can go back from the from the command mode into the edit mode by either pressing Enter or by just clicking inside the text field. 
uh, I'm telling you that mostly, so mostly it's it's a little bit of an annoyance because you start typing and you haven't noticed that you're in command mode and suddenly lots of things change. <laughs> but um, it doesn't it doesn't happen all that often. Um, every time you open um, a notebook, in the background um, a kernel starts running. The kernel is responsible for all your Python code. It stores all, it has all your 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 uh, variables and stuff. So this is basically where the code that you enter gets executed. And you can see here when I go, I've, I've just gone back to the to this overview, this this folder overview, that there is a that the that this um, icon here is start is green, and that means that it has a running kernel. Um, So let's start with the actual um, the actual uh, programming or the actual usage. Um, so the, make sure that the that the cell is in code mode so that the the you can see this uh, that there is this um, in in brackets in front of it, and uh, also here it's switched to code, and then um, you can try Python programs a equals three. Print a. Um, all of that you, you can print. You can enter many lines, and nothing of that has executed yet. Um, in order to run the cell, you can do two things. You can either press here the button "Run," which runs everything that's in, set, in there. So it has set a variable a, and has printed and has printed it. Um, and I can now use a a in the next one. Um, and I press run again, and you can see um, that it has that has that that it still knows a. And I can see here that I have to remember that I'm sitting so so close to the desktop. I have to remember that I to use the mouse and not my hands because I'd like to point out here, but that, that's useful for all of, for the people here with me, but not for the others. You can see up here there is no out because this was a result of a of a print statement. So this was not returned, whereas here I type a plus four, and um, the result that would have been returned by this is uh, is seven. So that was printed out, um, and you can see that it, it looks a little bit like um, like Python list notation. So we have some sort of index here. So what we can do, um, we can use we actually can use this as an as a list. So you can see that this the that this actually worked. I can also I think I can do the input as well. Yeah. So um, it stores everything in, a, in an internal variable. Um, I'm not sure why you would why you would want to use the ins. But the outs are can can be kind of useful if you just want to if you if you just quickly put something together. Um, because you don't always have to you don't always have to press run. What you can also do is um, you can press shift and return or shift and enter, and that also runs the command. In fact, there are. Um, Three different ways to run the command based on what you want to happen afterwards. Um, but shift enter basic the shift enter is the most convenient one. It runs the cell um, and then uh, automatically goes into edit mode on the next cell. Um, there are others uh, control enter is, is just run this cell and go into command mode. And uh, in, on the MacBook option and center, I think alt center on uh, alt enter on the on, on Windows is um, run the cell and create a new cell below this. Even if, so even if there is already one. Um, so if I were to press, um, what is it? Oh. So if I press Option and Enter, it will create a new cell. Whereas if I if I were to press um, Shift and Enter, it will just jump. Uh, it will just enter. Uh, it will just go to the next one. While I've been doing this, you also saw that these numbers always increase, um, which gives you some sort of indication about 
in which order the cells were executed. Because while logically you might think that they are executed from the top to the bottom, and I strongly recommend that you aim for this, the notebook itself doesn't actually do this. So if I say something like um, a equals 4, um, then, oh, see that's what I mean, print a, um, and then I set, then it says print 4, 4. If I now say a equals 6, and then I go back to here, and now it prints 6. Can you see that? So, um, mouse, not, fi not finger. Um, because it had, because um, it, this, this is what, what this number also gives quite a good inf indication of, because this is a higher number of, as this, you know that this has been executed after the one down here. Now, if you are completely, if, if you're getting um, a little bit confused, you want to just make sure that the that it's still everything is working the way you want it from the beginning. What you can do is you can go to the kernel and say, I want to restart the kernel, which means the kernel will forget everything that it knew um, and um, will simply, it gives me a warning here, and, and will simply um, start everything again. So if I now ran this cell, um, it will give me an error, I don't know what A is. Because we restarted the kernel, it doesn't know what A is, I just print A, it doesn't do it. What's the difference with saying clear kernel and clear kernel and output? So that's why I say I, I never use this option restart kernel myself. I always use for this reason, because you can see all these other things are still there, they're confusing. So I would strongly recommend always restart and clear output. That removes all the output and just leaves the cells themselves. So now you can go through this again, and um, you can you see that everything is uh, that everything is running um, the way it should be. Are there are there any questions? For now, can I delete a cell? So I have yes, I have lots of them. Yeah. So can if I you know? you can just de to delete them, you can um, select them, and then uh, press edit um, delete cell, okay. or you can just press on this on this scissor up here. Yeah. Um, you can also delete several either by pressing shift up and down, or you can um, uh, I think <coughs> control just just. Um, So you can you can select some multiple cells and delete them all in one go. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So um, I said that there is a second type of cell, and that's the markdown cell. And we switch that <coughs> over up here in this in this little thing and now you see that the in has disappeared that's the biggest in indication that this is no longer um, code cell so if I type something in a equals for print a and I now run this cell what you see is that it just produces text and it uses it produces text uh, based on the github uh, markdown language so um, there's almost certainly there's a there's a help here for how to for the syntax for this, but basically um, what you do is uh, if you just type text then we'll just um, interpret this as a paragraph. You can um, put in an empty uh, just an empty line to distinguish between paragraphs. If you want to have um, a heading, a single octothal, hashtag, and you would see that it's it's always it's already putting making it big in this in this cell. But if you press enter, it's, it also stays big. You can have um, subsections 
with several. I think this goes up to four or five deep. So it gets smaller and smaller. Um, you can um, tell it, uh, to, you can enter, enter code blocks like um, by, uh, by pressing um, the code. Uh, and that's this is um, this is the um, inverted single quotation mark that's basically um, above the tab key on your keyboard, and um, and that's that tells you, that tells it that this is a that this is a code, so it will change the layout. Um, you can also have code blocks. So, um, so the point of this is just to keep notes for yourself, yes. explain what you're doing. Sorry, yeah, I, I got a little bit distracted here um, with my with my notes. <laughs> so this is this this will help. This can help you not only keeping notes for yourself, but actually a lot of people uh, a lot of. Um, research organizations publish their notebooks in such a way where they basically use the use these markdown text to explain what they're doing and then use code blocks to do the extra calculations so everyone who gets the notebook can follow their instructions and check their check their their results and or make changes to analyze it slightly differently and um, it all go it's all in one in one setting um, the Markdown language is very is very powerful as well, but maybe I shouldn't go into too much detail here because again, that's not the topic of this section. Um, there are also other things that you can do with with the cells. So you might say, "Oh, I, I quickly want to just run a bash command." So, um, for example, you've created you've you've just created lots of single frames of something that you want to animate or something like that and um, to use that to to use that you might want to use a shell command to just um, convert all the still images to a to a to a to an to a give, animated gif or something like that so if you just put a single exclamation mark in there that tells jupyter okay this command i want to run as a bell as a bash uh, script so if i just press for example ls and then run enter. It will tell. It, it will list my directory. Um, I can make something more. Uh, maybe I shouldn't do that. So it, it, I can make a more complicated one. Like um, in this case, I've just printed out the contents of of this Jupyter notebook uh, file. So actually, you can see that it's. Um, I think it's a JSON format. Um, I don't. You might not need to know it, but it's actually you can. Um, it's uh, it, it is pers perfectly capable of, of you can perfectly use uh, Git or something like that to version control it. So it's not not as complicated. It works much better than if you had a work document or something like that. Um, so uh, we can. You can create the, you can create files. So if you now if you now run the command, we have this file is there, and we can also uh, remove. And now and now it's gone again. So um, these are very quick things to just do certain things um, if you want to find out. Okay, where is the where is Where's the file located that I want to open? LS from inside this um, inside such a shell can you can very quickly find it, and then you just can just uh, copy it into your into your uh, open data set command or something. And finally, we have uh, what IPython and Jupyter call magics. 
magics begin with a percent sign. And a single percent sign means that this is a magic that, that works on this line. Um, and whereas two, something that starts with two percent sign means this magic should work for the whole cell. And um, I give you LS magic uh, shows you just a list of all the magic commands that you can use. And there are quite a few of them. Um, but the most common one that I use is uh, time, time it, and of course also this double one here. So you can say um, percent time, and then whatever command you want to use. Uh, And it will not only run this command, it will not, yeah, it will not only run this command, but it also will tell you how much time it took to run this command. And you can even go a little bit further with time it, shift enter. Now it will run this command several times and then give you an average. So it says, okay, so an average, this took um, 7.03 milliseconds. Um, so you can use that to profile your code to see which part of your code is running slow, which one is, is running fast. And of course, as I said, um, with, with double percentages, um, that means it will, it will run the whole cell several times, and then um, give you the output again. So that's that's really useful if you want to figure out what's how much how mu much time does which option take. Um, another another magic is um, with these cell magics up here. Uh, you can actually change um, how. A cell is interpreted. So, so for example, I mean, normally the cell would be interpreted as a Python, as Python, but um, if you want to use, for example, um, HTML, you can just you can just type uh, percent percent HTML, and then everything that that runs into this in, in the cell would be interpreted as a as um, as a as an HTML thing, and that is useful. For example, if you go to uh, YouTube, and you go to uh, let's, see, let's take this video here. Everyone, go. Um, and then I can go to share, embed, just copy everything here, go back to my browser, type this here, punch shift enter. Now the video is put into the into this thing. So you can actually even refer to, to, to YouTube videos or other <coughs> things. You can make HTML forms if you want anything like that. Uh, Julio? Yes? Uh, there was someone who asked if you could uh, increase the size of your um, notebook. They can't see on the screen. Can you just zoom in? Zoom on the bottom right, that's this 100. Bottom right, yeah. Is this better? That's, a ver that's very big now. <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Okay. Um, there was a magic that you will see in many old um, old ones, and that is um, matplotlib inline. Um, 
that magic you just ran once in your in your code in your, in your notebook, and it would tell matplotlib output to be in the to be put into into the in line into the um, into the notebook. But this is so has been used so often that newer versions of JupyterNotebook do this implicitly. So you don't have to do that anymore. But in older versions of Jupyter Notebooks, you will still see it, and it doesn't hurt to have it. So if I um, uh, if I just create a, a plot, um, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt again. Apparently, uh, your member near the uh, VC has crashed. I don't know if you want yeah, to know. Oh, no, you're back. Thank okay. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, and then I can just plt.plot xy. And it will show me it, it show it shows the graph inside here. And that is something you will use quite a lot. And in older versions, you need this magic matplotlib inline to get this to get this show up like this. Actually, you can say plt show. Um, Volker, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can I also have it as a pop-up window instead of having it inline? The figure. That's a very good question. Um, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, does anyone else? Scott, Aiden uh, Aid is not there. What was the question, sir? Whether you can, if instead of having the plot lib inline, do we have? Is there also a way to have them pop uh, with a pop-up window? I don't believe so. Um, never tried. It might be possible. Um, I mean. I, look, I'm, I'm almost I'm almost through with the stuff that I want to talk about. If there's still time at the end, um, we'll investigate that a little bit, okay? Hey, okay. Sure. Yes? A quick online search shows that uh, the matplotlib magic, uh, you don't necessarily have to put in line. You can put uh, like an iterative backend, like TK, and then it works. Ah. It makes sense. Oh yeah. So this is this this just popped up. So yep, you can use um, you can use this, but most people will use this in line. Um. So, any questions up to here? Yeah, I, I have one question. Um, so when you're done, let's say you want to develop some code, and then you use the, the notebook because it's very handy. Yeah. And then when you're done with developing and you would like a Python script at the end, is it possible to save it? Like yes. Transform it into was, a Python script? This was actually the next thing I wanted to talk about. Um, once, you've, once you've finished with your, with your um, whole code, you can go up here to file and then um, what? download as yes that was it. And you can do you can do it in different ways. You can just use it as a iPython notebook, which basically creates a copy of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also um, it can also be converted to a LaTeX script, or you can use um, a Python script. Which actually um, is use ha, you comments out all the sections that you that have all the markdown things and stuff, um, and has a lot more um, stuff in there. But it runs. Mm -hmm. It's a Python script, fully uh, version Python script. You can also 
out, out, um, output is an HTML. So if, I, if you want a static HTML page that you just put it on your blog or something that you don't want people to change, but you want to have it. So um, you can do that. So if I were to, if I say download, um, save as, and I wanted to um, training, 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 uh, Python, training, 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 so if you, so here this is the training.pi. So if I go to, um, if I go to the script, you can see that there it, it has these um, these comments, which page they're in, mm -hmm. but um, it it has the the, the markdown scripts here. Um, oh yeah, that was these were the um, these were my my bash commands so it's but it it, it should per, it should work perfectly fine um, you if you go to this um, if you go to this page up here again with it where, where it says that where it gives you the the file browser um, Uh, if if something is sorry, let's one other thing. So if if you are if something is running, if the kernel is this keeps running, so so now the kernel is running forever, and, and I've just created an infinite loop. But if if it's hanging as well, um, what you can do, you can just interrupt the kernel. So. If, here, no, this is just green. If I I can just interrupt the kernel either by pressing this button or by kernel interrupt, and that basically just says okay, it's stopped now, um, and you can just keep going with new, with with new stuff. Uh, and these are the so so <laughs> okay. And now, now I'm coming. Uh, now I was supposed to talk about exporting stuff. Um, so this thing is, um, you might say, this is, this runs in a browser. That's browser. That's really nice. Um, what does it mean? I mean, a browser is meant to actually connect to remote machines, and all of this is running on my local machine. Can I connect to remote machines? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, there is, you can technically run Jupyter on a remote machine and tell it to listen to an external port, but we have um, create, but we have created scripts um, to run it on VDI and on Gadi, and I'll, I, that's what I'd like to show you next. So you can just here press um, quit. It says server has stopped. Um, you can close the close the tab, so you can just go out here and. Um, if you go here, it says kernel, kernel has shut down. You can also, if you run it, you can also just here control C out to have to do that. Um, if you go in your home directory, or if you go anywhere else, um, you can you can get these scripts to run to con to connect your to 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 Jupyter on a remote machine um, on to uh, to get. You need to clone our our scripts. Um, to use that, you use Git. I hope you have Git. If not, um, try to figure out how to get Git and or, or contact us. Uh, git clone, GitHub.https, uh, GitHub.com, slash coe cms set of excellence cms slash nci underscore scripts. And um, I just put it in a different directory because um, I already have the NCI scripts there. 
If you go into this directory, into this directory, you see two two scripts um, that you can use. VDI Jupyter. Um, in order to use VDI, uh, VDI is a is a virtual computers on the NCI cloud. Um, normally, people would use them to log in with a remote desktop. Um, but this VDI Jupyter script just connects to them and starts a Jupyter instance of Jupyter Notebook on them, and then connects your local computer to it. In order to access that, you have to have um, access to VDI. Um, so you need to be a member of at least one group um, on NCI that has um, access to VDI. To VDI. Um, so you, you can check this uh, by going to my.nci.org.au, and then you see all the groups that you're that you're a member of. And for example, if I go to let's say uh, RR7, RR7 you can see has access to uh, GData, but there's no NCI there. Whereas if I went to um, come on W35, for example, that has that has VDI here. So um, if you run um, in this directory VDI um, to Python, it's the first time you run it, it will ask you certain things. So it will ask you for your NCI username. Um, you will ha might have to enter your NCI password depending on whether you're. It's it's trying to use the configuration from Strudel. If you have set this up, if it doesn't find it, it has to do everything itself. But we've found, we, I've tried it out. Um, it actually works. So now I'm connected to to a system on to 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 Python running on VDI. So if I um, I can just create uh, a new Python three uh, thing there. And I can actually, the, that's one of the good things about VDI, um, is I have access to GData. So I can actually work on, if, if, your dat, if your data is on the NCI machines with VDI, you can basically run, um, get the interactivity from running something on your computer, because all the, all the interface is on your computer, while at the same time having, uh, accessing the data on the NCI machines, so that's really that's really powerful, uh, really useful, and that's um, why you want to do that. Um, any questions there? Just point out that VDI doesn't, uh, doesn't use your compute allocation. Um, Sorry? So, uh, VDI doesn't use your compute allocation, so you yes. can basically use this one for free as much as you want. So, yeah, so you can run on VDI as much as much as, as long as you want. I think it does get restarted every three days or something like that. Is it possible? I don't, I don't know. But it doesn't eat into your, your resource allocations. Um, again, I can just here press here quit, or I can go to my um, to this and press Control C, Control Z, uh, C, and say yes, and we'll shut down. It will shut down the system and disconnect. It will now it should now tell me here yeah, that's no longer there. Yeah, connection. Yes. Yes. Um, if you want to run, if your if your Python analysis needs or would benefit from running in parallel on several cores. You might say, oh, I want to put in something on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the PBS system on Gadi. Well, we have you, uh, we have you covered there as well. Uh, Gadi Jupyter, and you can actually, there are several options that you can give. You can give um, your, user, your username um, which queue you want it to be in, so express or normal, um, which project you want to you want to charge. Of course, this will create a job in the queue. 
And so uh, I don't know if I, I can try it. Um, uh, minus Q express minus N, let's say four CPUs minus PW35. I, I don't know how long it will take until this until it starts. Um, once it starts, it will automatically um, set everything up and set your your computer up. Um, actually, Scott wrote most of this. So questions to him or to the C or, or to the help desk. Just send it to the help desk. Um, I'm going to I'm going to cancel this now. Uh, there is one difference between this and this is that. Um, the NCI, this 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 Gadi Jupyter actually start the, the Jupyter notebook isn't the most recent iteration. It said that IPython is an is, is improved on Python, and Jupyter notebook is basically in use. Like, there is already the next iteration, and that is Jupyter Lab. Um, so uh, it looks. It look it looks a little bit different, um, but everything that you that I've told you about the Jupyter notebook you can also do here. So um, if I I can create a new I can create a new notebook by just pressing on here, and you see I again have the cells that I can select between code and markdown. Um, I can um, run and interrupt and and all these things. So it's it's the same thing. In fact, I can even open the notebooks that I've run before um, with this. So it's it's the everything you did with, with Jupyter Notebook you can also do with Jupyter Lab. And um, I'm only giving you that because Gadi Jupyter is opens an instance of Jupyter Lab and not Jupyter um, Notebook. But it's the same it, it everything you can do with notebook you can do with lab. Good question. Yes. Uh, so uh, the difference between the VDI version and the Gadi Jupyter version is that on Gadi I can ask any more cores if I want. Um, yeah, on, on Gadi, what it does, uh, the, the Gadi script basically submits a job to the queue, and you can do anything you can do on the queue with any job um, in the on on, on, on Gadi. So you can um, say I want forty-eight cores and. 100 gigabytes of memory, and but mm -hmm. you will have to pay the appropriate um, SUs yeah. for that, yeah. um, depending on, on whatever your job is. But of course, you have a lot more computing power to do that. You have a lot. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot more memory if you want to work. If you need to work on large data sets. So you. And on VDI, you... what's the what's the standard? What do we get when we do the VDI Jupiter? Um, the VDI system are basically similar to normal desktop desktop computers. I'm not quite sure what the specifications of the systems are. Um, most things you could do on your computer, you can also do on VDI. Um, it's yeah. I, uh, sorry, Jingbo, do you know? Uh, you get eight CPU. But the thing is that sometimes you share in the VDI with someone else, so you might not always have the full power of the eight CPU. So you have to try and see if it works. So it's you however know. many people get connected. Yeah, the more Sorry? people connect to VDI, the slower the system will get. Um, it's not that less like that. You're actually sharing an instance with another potentially another two users. Um, so, so like if, 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 if all of us if all of us now connect to VDI, we have to divide it between thirty? No, 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 no. No. So it's like to to extend the number of the so you create your own desktop kind of thing, but actually you are sharing the amount of CPUs with potentially with another extra yeah. two people maximum. So it could be just okay. you running, it could be yeah. some Sometimes if you check, if you use PS to check who is running, you can see that there might appear one or two user at the maximum. Okay, thanks. So. 
Oh. Also, if you're using the uh, Guardi Jupyter script and are asking for more than one CPU, you will need to do something special to actually use more than one CPU in Python. By default, a Python script will only use uh, one CPU. Um, so whether that's using multiprocessing or Dask or whatever, there's a few different ways you can parallelize a Python program. Um, and we're not going to go into them today, uh, but you will need to do something. It's not automatically going to use 48 CPUs if you request that. I uh, just put some okay. facts about uh, BDI specifics um, into the chat box. So basically, it depends on how many people logging in the same logging node. Um, if just yourself, you have the full capacity, but if you share with somebody else, and then you share the same pool of resource. So it's kind of dynamic and it's sometimes not completely under your own control. And the maximum session time is seven days. So your session can start and running in the background maximum for seven days and then it will kill your job if it doesn't finish. So um, it's, it, it's, it, most of the things it should be good enough for. If you want to analyze your, your data, if you want to just check some stuff, 95% um, of, of the stuff you want to use Python for anyway, uh, VDI should be good enough. Um, if you want to really do something that needs to have parallel processing in Python, um, at some point you would also start to wonder whether Python is actually the right thing, to, the right tool to use, I think. That's my personal opinion, I don't know. Um, there are certain things you can do with, I mean, Dask can use parallel processing quite easily. Um, so for some s s simple things, um, it might still be useful to have parallel processing. I don't think I've ever used, I've, I've all, ever really used parallel Python. Um, a lot. I've, I've tried it. I've played a little bit around with it, but I'm not sure I've ever used it productively. Scott will probably has. Um, he's. Did you or? No, he uses parallel stuff all the time. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. Um, basically, I'm giving. I'm, I'm talking about the options that you have. Um, what? you need is ultimately something that you will have to decide what you need um, and then you can uh, I hope that you have received some information about what options are there and how to use it um, and next week Scott will get into more detail on how to use the Jupyter notebook I think what 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 exactly are you talking will you be talking about oh so some of that ask stuff I was alluding to earlier Yep. And analyzing, or ways to analyze really big data sets. Um, so we'll take a, a, a little bit of a look at that sort of stuff. Um, uh, can I just, sorry, can yes. I just add another, add another thing about the BDI? Like Jimbo was saying, it lasts, a session lasts seven days, but if it's you need to log in for at least one hour every 24 hours. And this is in regardless that you're leaving something running in the background. If you don't do that, it'll, the system will think of it's not activity on this and um, your session will die. So it's just in case. I also want to add some comments between um, BDI versus Gadi. Um, for some recommendation for the lightweight um, sequential data processing workflow, VDI is recommended only, um, um, as you said, uh, if it is a very um, compute intensive program, need a multiple cores, and um, GADI is a better option. But you ha also have the risk of uh, wasting resource if you kind of using um, a lightweight program but running on GADI by requesting multiple cores. Um, so you just have to balance off your uh, need um, in different environments. Hmm. 
Oh, and one last thing. Um, these programs, uh, um, VDR Jupyter and Getty Jupyter, they're using the Python environments we have installed under the HH5 project at NCI. So you will need to become a member of HH5 before using them. Oh yeah, that's important. Uh, that's that's good. To, thanks for tell, for saying that. Yes, that's that's something that I had forgotten to to mention. That's yeah, that's good. So you need to be a member of of HH of the group HH5. Um, we're generally pretty liberal with giving out membership. You just have to request it. And just to make sure, when you re to request membership of a project is always via my.nci.org.au. Okay. I'm not sure about you, but I've already had the first person knock the door, knock at the door. It's now uh, 2 p.m. Um, I think we'll we'll leave it here for now, and next week uh, Scott will tell us about how to operate on large data sets with Python. And I hope you see I see all of the of you again. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Everybody.